Hey everybody, welcome back to A Brief on Grief. Today I'm here for something a little different. Um, when I made the previous video, um, I remember that I was had shared with you, or highlighted with you against the six main uh, myths about uh, dealing with grief. And I highlighted the ones that I tend to use the most in my life. So one of them was the be strong for others. So the belief that when I was struggling that, well, I should I still needed to be strong for others and that limited my ability to deal with grief and 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 process it properly. But as the day went on for me yesterday, I realized I, I reflected a little bit, but then I just I wasn't thinking about it for a while and just these this clarity came in. It's amazing. I love the universe. This is these are the things it brings. It's amazing. But it just brought in clarity about that this, there was more to this than just a way that I adapted to grief. I adapted being strong for others. So being strong for others, being loving for others, being always being loving and kind and somebody that displays vulnerability that I realized I adopted that way of being, that I needed to be this way and that that was something that I adapted because of my trauma. So from being disconnected early on from my dad, like a very crucial person in my life and a crucial relationship early on, I, I'm realizing that I like adapted this belief of who I had to be to be loved by people, to be lovable, to demonstrate love to other people. And but it was like, the word is need, like I feel like I needed to be that way. And so not only to f feel or to ensure that I would be loved, I thought it would ensure that I would be loved by people, but I also adapted this, adopted this in a way to support other people that didn't feel loved, or maybe to support people that were similar to my dad in a way, you know, in pain. Like even as a kid, I was aware of that innately somehow. People that were in pain, that, that disconnected and isolated themselves when they were in pain. They had a hard time like coming towards people, hard time with vulnerability and sharing. So I, I, I think I gravitated towards people like that as well. And that the awareness of that is huge because this is the journey that I've been on this whole like more than a year is realizing the role that I play in some in the patterns in my life and the suffering that I has gone through in my life um, and the disappointment is that realizing that I can't blame you know others you know all the time that I play a role in this too so realizing that I've been kind of wearing this costume or this mask of feeling like I needed to be this I needed to be lovable and kind and and vulnerable so that I could ensure that people wouldn't leave me, ensure that people would love me, not disconnect from me, and also help heal other people's hearts. So of course that doesn't work and it hasn't always worked. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't or in a certain relationship, maybe it would work for a little bit, but then not. And eventually it would, you know, a relationship would fall apart and there'd be so much pain there. But in a way, that dreaded shame dragon came in too because when I couldn't, when I couldn't, when I was being this way and somebody wouldn't be able to open up and connect with me, even though I was doing it with them, it was, it not only created shame in me because it was kind of like, well, what, what, what else can I do? And that trauma I have in me too about disappointing, which is also connected with my dad. I felt like I was always disappointing him. I could never do the right thing. So again, I shame myself because I was disappointed that they still couldn't connect with me even though I was doing it, or I'd be angry and resentful towards them. And none of those feelings like foster a healthy relationship. So that just clarity on the role that I play in that, I mean, or more clarity just in this past day, like I've been getting little bits of that for so long in the last few months. And to realize that that's a way that I've adopted being and the energy that that has sucked out of me. 
the energy and the power that that takes away from you when you feel like you need to be a certain way that's where shame comes in like shame is that feeling that we feel when we're not measuring up when we're not being a good enough daughter a good enough wife a good enough citizen a good good enough worker at work all these things that we think we have to be and we have to say we have to speak we have to look like so that we're accepted and loved in this world and when we do things that are against that that's where the shame comes in so we shame ourselves but then we get shame externally too from people that are also <laughs> under the weight of having to be that perfection stuff and shame is easily to just easy to just put on somebody else so that you lessen the load on yourself that's a whole other topic <laughs> um but to realize that I've been limited, I've been limited in really being who I really am based on these ways that I've adopted that I have to be. And this is what naturally happens with trauma, especially early on trauma, is that your body is not able to process that as a child. It get, you, you learn to deal with it in ways that are unhealthy, like all these myths, like distracting yourself and and being strong for others and all the other ones and then then it gets stuck in you but and but you're still suffering so you just you you adopt these ways you decide that you need to be this way you need to be this way act this way say talk this way love these people this way so that people will love you and that's the way your trauma creates these patterns that you have of being in your life and they work for you. I mean, that's the way they obviously worked early on, but they don't always work. And as you get older and older, like behaviors that would have worked when you were young, they don't tend to work when you're older. Um, and to... And I'm saying this now because, and how much it relates to grief, because that be strong for others myth brought this clarity to me today but it also it highlights why the awareness of grief and loss and the the gifts that I've gotten out of doing this specific grief recovery program that's what's healing this stuff that's what's like bringing that awareness of all these things that I've done in my life or all these beliefs that I've adopted in my in my mind about how I needed to be to survive pain or how I needed to be to protect myself or how I needed to be so that people would love me and not leave me. And the, all that limiting stuff like that, that keeps this like costume and mask, like I this costume and mask on me, like I'm not even being my true self. And now that I get to like, just get rid of that stuff. And that's what I've been doing for months is just peeling it away. And like, that doesn't belong. That is not helpful. Oh my God, that's not true about myself or that's not true about the world. And literally like falling in love with myself, myself, tr the true, my true self and falling in love with this universe that's so magical and so out to support me and loving, loving, trusting myself and this universe in a way that I never, never knew before, I, that I've never known. And it's created space, like this pain and the, the grief that I've been holding for years. When that stuff starts to melt away, it's amazing what comes in. It's, I mean, it's amazing. And what I've lived with like week after week and month after month, as this stuff is shifting and healing. This is why I'm making these videos. This is why I'm so inspired to share this stuff. I mean, like I said in, a, in an early video, like after the first like session or two, I just wanted to be at the top of every mountain <laughs> and screaming this stuff to people like, because it it's changing my life. It is changing everything in my life. It is allowing myself to fall in love with myself <laughs> and this magical universe in a way that I never knew. I mean, I said that already, but it's, it's so profound. It's so healing that yes, I mean, I'm here.
making these episodes <laughs> after episode to share this, to try to communicate the impact that this has had on my life, the impact that these unhealthy beliefs about grief and loss, how they impact us, how they, they're that glue that like keeps that trauma stuffed into our body, you know, topped off with a whole crap load of shame that just like, and it just weighs you down and it keeps that trauma in your body and weighs you down and weighs you down until there's not really room for anything else. You're just running around trying to not feel bad and trying to keep busy to distract yourself and trying to do things that create joy, but there's only so much space in your body for joy and love and excitement because you're carrying all this pain. And that is, that is the most wonderful thing that I've seen like unfolding like every day, every week inside of me is the space that that's opened up for more love and compassion, gratitude. I'm grateful for like a million things every day and to feel compassion towards people that have caused me pain or contributed to pain in my life. Some of the, you know, my husband or my soon to be ex-husband, even back to my dad. I carry more love in my heart right now for my dad than I ever have and more compassion for his trauma and to understand his behavior and his limitations for connecting with me and that it had nothing to do with me. That's a whole other video because that's a whole other something that's come up in the last few days. But I think I'm going to leave it there before this gets way too long. But the power, the power of understanding grief and loss in a way that's not how we've been taught all our life, it is totally life changing. It is changing my life and I want everybody to have this. Okay. Lots of love, everybody. I'll see you next time.